In this episode, I am once again joined by Justin von Boydash, American Buddhist teacher, chaplain, and author of Modern Tantric Buddhism. Justin describes his powerfully transformative dark retreat practice, in which he embarked on multiple seven-day and 49-day meditation retreats in complete darkness under the guidance of Dr. Nida Chenatsang. Justin recalls his life-changing encounter with the rarefied religious experience of Rigpa and details his visions of spiritual beings, animals, elements, and bardo deities. Justin recalls his first meeting with Dr. Nida, how he became his student, and explains the significance of Dr. Nida's endorsement of Justin as both a Dzogchen teacher and dark retreat guide. Justin also reveals the daily routine and practice instructions for dark retreat, and reflects on current trends within American Buddhism and non-duality today. So without further ado, Justin von Boydash. Justin von Boydash, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Steve. It's wonderful to be here with you again. Well, I'm so pleased to be talking with you again today, and we were just discussing before we recorded how well received your first interview, or our first interview together, I mean, um, yeah. was. So thank you very much for that, and I'm happy you're back. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was, it was a joy being here the first time, and I, I look forward to where we go today. Yeah. Well, where we're going to go today, where we're going to start, is where we left off in the last interview. We set up a bit of a cliffhanger, and you had said that your experience in dark retreat and studying Atta Yoga under Dr. Nida Chenatsang had in a way, revolutionized your own orientation, moving you away from the project of cultural transference of the religion of, so we say, Tibetan Buddhism into America, which you write about in your book, Modern Tantric Buddhism, and towards something rather different. <laughs> and we, we began to touch on that. And that was a, a fascinating, fascinating to hear you describe that, or a reorientation, I think. <laughs> So let's start there. I'm wondering if we might explore those things. So let's start there. So Dr. Nida Chenak Sang, how was it you came to meet him? And yeah. how was it you became how was it you began to collaborate with him here and, and take teachings from him? Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um so I first connected with Dr. Nida in um so either 2015 or 2016. Um I have a friend, we have a mutual friend who used to do uh, textual translation work for him, um, who used to live in, in the Portland area. And I've known her since, um, actually since the days when the previous Boko Rinpoche was alive. We, we met because we, we both studied with him. And she kept saying, you've got to meet, you know, this person, Dr. Nita Chanatsang, he's, he's incredible. And uh, and I, you know, my my friend uh, Lama Shah is somebody who I I trust explicitly, and <laughs> everybody always says, "Oh, you got to meet this teacher." I, I I know I have, you know, they're so great. And it's not that I didn't think uh, much of it. It was uh, it was it was actually more just the circumstances. Um, uh, he he was spending a lot of time on the West Coast, and it was difficult for me to get out there. And then. Um, it turns out a friend of mine was hosting him in the New York City area, and uh, my friend Shar suggested I go meet him, especially to show him a text that um, one of my uh, teachers in Sikkim had given me in uh, the early 2000s that was an Atta Yoga text that just had pictures of Togal visions, right? So the entire, you know, maybe we could say there um, of this Pecha oh, you know, maybe there are 30 words in the whole text and and the rest are all visions. And so uh, I had shown this to Boko Rinpoche, I had shown this to uh, Geltsa Rinpoche, I had shown this to Lama Wangdu Rinpoche, um, and Boko Rinpoche knew that it was a Dzogchen text, and he said, you know, I can't really help you with this, but be careful who you show it to, only show it to realized teachers. When I showed it to Geltsa Rinpoche, he just handed it back and didn't say anything. <laughs> and then with Lama Wangdu, Lama Wangdu was like, oh, yeah, I know this, you know. And I was like, oh, wonderful. Can you, you know, uh, you know, would you mind talking about it or explaining it? And he was like, oh, it was such a long time ago. So I was a, a little bit of a loss. Um, 
and so, um, you know, under the advice of my friend Shar, I went to see Dr. Nita and, and I showed it to him. And the first thing he asked me was, where did you get this? And I explained about Putting Room Bajay, uh, who, when I met him, he was in his late 80s. He had come down from Tibet to Sikkim in the 1930s, completely before the Chinese invasion of Tibet. And he had been a student of Shukseb, a very, you know, very famous female uh, uh, lineage holder of the, the Lunch and Nindic. And it turns out one of uh, Dr. Nita's teachers, Ani Geltsen, uh, was also a student. She actually, she was like the heart daughter of um, uh, Shukseb. And so I explained that to him and, you know, he was like, oh, I know all about this text. This is a dark retreat text. And, and then, you know, of course, I immediately asked, well... <laughs> You know, can you teach it to me? And he was like, "Oh, you know, eventually." <laughs> and um, Mirror of Light had just come out, and he was like, "Look, I'm going to be, uh, you know, teaching, um, you know, Mirror of Light in the Portland area. You should come out." And so I did receive instructions on that, and uh, you know, I felt a, a real connection with Dr. Nita. He reminded me quite a bit of my root teacher Ani Zongmo, uh, very informal, playful, uh, also very. Um, I could say, you know, much more focused on embodied practice, um, you know, authentic, real practice in your bones, in your blood, you know, in in your body, right, in 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 your being, rather than theoretical practice. So, uh, you know, I received these Atta Yoga instructions from Dr. Nita, and then I, um, you know, I, I practiced them, and then I became very busy with my work at New York City Department of Correction. And, you know, still kept up my, my personal Atta Yoga practice. Um, and it wasn't until during the pandemic that I reached out to Dr. Nita. I was, um, it was very early one morning and, and during the pandemic, one of my jobs became blessing bodies of people who had died of COVID in New York City's Pottersfield. And so one morning uh, I was on a pier waiting for the ferry to go to the island. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, oh, you know, I should reach out to Dr. Nita and see, you know, where we can go with this. And um, messaged him, he messaged right back, said, oh, you know, the, we just translated, you know, this uh, Tibetan text into English. Uh, why don't you take a look and we'll schedule, you know, some time in the coming weeks for instruction on this. Um, and moved right into that and, um, you know, and we've been working, you know, very closely ever since. So that was about 2020, fall of 2020, um, uh, is, is when that happened. And the, uh, the buildup to this, so, you know, I had probably at that point, 20, 25 years of Mahamudra, and Trekcha instruction that I had been engaged in, you know, up until this point. So, you know, to some extent, we could say that my practice was um, solid. Dr. Nita gave me some instruction for, you know, preparing. Um, and dark retreat requires a lot of personal preparation in terms of stability of practice and, and things of this nature, but then also the specificity of what's needed for environment, right? The specific location where a retreat will happen. And the circumstances under which um, the retreat um, can be facilitated need to be in place as well. So that that took me, um, I say, like you know, eight months to to be able to arrange. Um, and my goal at first was to do the forty nine day dark retreat, and so Dr. Nita had me do a seven day preparatory retreat. Uh, which I did, and then a, a couple weeks, I think I had about two and a half weeks between that one and then the 49-day retreat, which I did after that. And then since then, I've done um, two seven-day um, dark retreats, and then I have another one scheduled uh, for later this summer. Um, and the practice, you know, kind of piggybacking off of the end of our last conversation i don't think i was <laughs> prepared for the impact of the practice um and and i think you know kind of directly relating to to how you opened today's conversation previously i was very interested and focused and 
in and perhaps also invested in um, this cultural transference, right? That's that's the way it made sense conceptually. This is what, you know, uh, with an understanding of this is what ha had happened in the past, for example, you know, in, in Dharma moving from India to Tibet, and then of course, you know, not just Tibet, but Bhutan, et cetera, you know, Nepal, all the different kind of cultural uh, manifestations of it. And then of course, you know, spreading here, uh, and what changed was a kind of very natural recognition that that perspective <laughs> is very self-conscious and that actually this transplanting of dharma only happens one way, and this is just through the natural embodiment of the view, right? And so dark retreat really helps manifest an alignment, like a natural, stable, in-depth integration of the view, which becomes, um, it, 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 it's almost as if it's, it becomes indelible, right? It, 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 you can't, it's like you can't unsee it. You can't unsee this experience of Rigpa. You can't un, even undo it to some extent. And what's fascinating is that I still, I had a conversation with Dr. Nita at one point um, in preparation for the 49 day retreat where he was, he asked, you know, how much time do you have for integration afterwards? And, you know, I, I had this very kind of busy, um, uh, you know, high pressure, slightly high power position with New York City Department of Corrections. So I was already taking 49 days off from work, you know, to do that, to take more for integration was a little bit of a challenge, but I was able to squeak in, you know, maybe four or five days. And he was like, oh, okay, you know, that's, that's not too bad. But he's like, you know, but you realize in Tibet, we would do like three months. <laughs> it was just like, okay, like, you know, what am I in store for? And what's fascinating is that then became something I was very interested in and still am like, you know, this, this kind of, um, in our very kind of mechanistic, uh, um, you know, materialist way of thinking, we may think, oh, I'm going to a retreat that ends on a Sunday and then and I can go to work on Monday and the retreat is over. Right. But, but actually what, what, actually ends up happening is this entire spiritual process begins to happen during the retreat and and the impact of that bleeds into you know whatever post you know retreat experiences is, is had and i bring this all up because i feel that there is still this unraveling that's happening even now you know from even the 49 day retreat but let alone these these subsequent you know shorter dark retreats that have this way of kind of you know uh, pushing me back into this experience um, very quickly, and the this unraveling um, is continuing, you know, even even right now. Um, so it's been fascinating to 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 watch, and it's been um, it's been interesting. Um, I, you know, I've been very grateful, I guess you could say, because I can see growth. You know, this is a really nice a nice thing. Yes, that's very fascinating indeed. I wonder if I might ask you a couple of technical questions and then and then go back into the experiential. Sure. So you said you did a seven day preparatory retreat mm -hmm. and that was a dark retreat or not? Yes, yes. Yeah. So that was a, that was a seven day yeah preparatory dark retreat. And so um, the instructions used for that one differ from what are used afterwards so for the 49 days and then for shorter dark retreats um and this um style of um preparation was really basically to uh you know begin to acquaint myself with being in complete darkness you know the, the, we what we don't really recognize so quickly is that complete darkness is something we almost have no idea about, you know, most days, you know, you might say, oh, the bedroom's so dark, or oh, I walked into this dark closet, <laughs> you know, or whatever, but like, you know, uh, to, to be in a place where there isn't a pinprick of light, and to be doing absolutely everything, eating and bathing and using the bathroom and all this stuff, you know, in complete darkness, um, and also, you know, in, in a solitary 
setting as well. Um, uh, it takes a little getting used to. And then of course, you know, the other thing that, that, that is, um, requires a tremendous getting used to, to it are all of the visions that arise. Uh, so this is a very, you know, even though one is in darkness, uh, in the beginning for me, after about two to two and a half days, then the visions began. So even in the seven day retreat, and then, um, uh, around the fourth day um, of the preparatory retreat, it began became very difficult to discern the difference between the dream state and whatever quote unquote waking state I happened to be in. So, you know, I'd have these experiences of dreaming, these very vivid dreams, and then I would open my eyes and the dream would still be continuing, you know, before me. Um, so there's an adjustment around that. And then also, this is also where kind of the risk comes into these kinds of practices, because um, there can be um, a, a danger, uh, especially for practitioners who take everything that arises as very real, right? So, uh, you know, imagine being, I think, you know, a close equivalent, but while not the same necessarily, is plant medicines, right? So hallucinogenics, if, if you were to, uh, you know, take some kind of hallucinogen and then uh, ascribe ultimate reality me level of meaning to every single vision that occurred or every single thought, you know, it, or, 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 or shift in thinking or mentation, um, you'd probably get into some trouble. And what's what's fascinating is I've read um, a very sh uh, a short dark retreat text by Jamgang Kantra Lodra Tai, who mentions in the Kalafan the the point about how dangerous these practices can be, um, with you know a a, a certain element of uh, you could say there's there's always a, there's a risk at times of psychosis for a small group of people. But even in Jamgang Kantrul's day, you know, this was apparent. And I'd come across also a, a footnote um, in, in a conversation that Kempo Tsulchum Gamso was, was giving on dark retreat or Yangti practice. And, and he similarly said that um, it used to be practiced a little bit more commonly in the Karmakaji tradition, but there was a prevalence of people having these, these kind of, you know, mental breaks. And, and so it, the, the practice was um, uh, slowed down a little bit. So it's, it's actually not common these days to find this practice within the Karmakaji tradition. Um, and, and, you know, this, the, there's a lot in this about, um, the popularity, you know, dark retreat is, is getting in, in, in a popular spiritual culture um, because the risk is real, right? And um, and it's debatable as to how much uh, preparation people really have um, or, or how valued that is, especially in, in you know, pop spiritual uh, kind of worldview. Yeah, so now an abundance of questions yeah, sure. preparation of questions <laughs> sure, sure, sure. yeah so one more technical question well yeah, of course if it'll be one more but and then and I'm, I'm noting all these experiences and i'd like to return to them of course. um what lineage was it in was this in the long ting uh long ting intig was it based on your text were you being taught your particular text that you received from your teacher in sakim so, or was this a broader uh um dark retreat initiation uh a dark retreat uh uh, teaching so this text came from uh a vision uh that dr nita had and um so it, it's very like a very unique you know text and i i you know we could say that it, it's you know aligned with um the the yutuk nintik do you mean to say that the teacher the text your teacher gave you in sikkim came from a vision of dr nita's hmm. previous no no, no, no. The teaching, the 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 practice of dark retreats, which I learned from Dr. Nita, came from a text that he composed, um, and then the teacher that the the text that I had, yes, is more coming from the Lunchen Lunchen Nintic um, side of things. Um, so the, I'm I'm what 
I wasn't practicing was the exact text that Patrick Rinpoche had. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. So it's a terma of Dr. Dida. Mm. I would say so. I don't know what he would say. <laughs> but, you know, I have faith in him. Um, uh, you know, these, you know, uh, yeah, very much like, you know, the Mirror of Light, for example, is his... Um, you know, his commentary, his collection and presentation on Atiyoga Yoga from, from the Utah Nintic. Um So, yeah, somebody should ask him that. Perhaps I will, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it might, might be interesting to have a dialogue, actually, between the two of you about Dark Retreat. What do you think? I would love that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, well, let's propose that to him. Okay. Sure. Um, all right. So you mentioned the vision and dreams. Now, I'm wondering... Did you have any background before Dark Retreat in having visions or in dream yoga practice? Were you quite adept at that or already going in? Um, what was your relationship prior to the Dark Retreats in particular to visions and, and dreams? Yeah, so dream yoga, I had studied, uh, you know, initially uh, within the Karmakaju Six Yogas of Naropa tradition um, under Gelsa Rinpoche. Uh, and it had been probably, um, I don't know, maybe like 10 years or so since I'd received that instruction um, by the time I was uh, working with Dr. Nita on this. I've also, you know, engaged the the Utagnintic dream yoga practice. Um, so I, I am a very kind of vivid dreamer um, and I have had, you know, visionary dreams Um I think you know some some people just do you know have a, a propensity for this kind of thing and and I also think that um, I think it's not particularly startling that that people will have these experiences. I think what what becomes problematic is that when when people become attached to them, when we become attached to them, then the, you know the experiences it becomes um, problematic. So. The what I have learned from this practice of dark retreat is is, is a lot about myself, um, especially with respect to being somebody who can kind of uh, <laughs> slip out of how tight this kind of you know reality experience can be into this more kind of you know open um, visionary kind of experience. Um, so, uh, going back to your your original question, it's not that you know dream yoga was a a Prominent practice of mine, um, specifically, um, but I have gone through periods of, of practicing it, you know, in, in in detail. Do you mean to say there that these dark retreats have opened a capacity for slipping into this sort of visionary space whilst not in dark retreat? Is that what your previous comment meant meant to imply? Um, uh, you know. A little bit, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's so what dark retreat does, right? So dark retreat is essentially, you know, a togal practice uh, using darkness, right? And and so uh, within the context of other forms of togal, you can use, you know, there's white instructions and yellow instructions and black instructions and white instructions is using a light source um, like the moon, full moon, or the sun, or or this kind of thing. Uh, the yellow instructions are a combination of being in darkness a little bit and then in in you know lit experience. And then uh, darkness is uh, you know refers to having this uh, you know complete sensory deprivation with respect to light, which causes uh, these experiences visionary experiences to arise from within us and the subsequent effect of having you know engaged in this practice is the a kind of um deconstruction or reorganizing of our relationship to appearance you know itself which is to say that it opens our ability to have a much less heavily structured binary relationship to you know the visual field right which therefore allows our our experience of what is uh encountered 
in the visual visual field to perhaps be a little bit more subtle uh, than than we're typically experienced. Does that does that make sense? Yes. Uh I mean, it makes it doesn't make sense to me experientially, of course, because I haven't experienced it, but it certainly makes sense. Your description. Yes, it does. Very interesting. And that binary presumably is the binary between what I can see out of my eyes, like I can see you on my Zoom screen and what I can see, if you want, in my mind. I'm imagining right now a big green dragon, for example. Right. That's inside. Exactly. That's, so to but, say, not real. Right. Yeah. But the, the, what I can see out here, the computer screen and your image on it, that's that's real. Right. That's the sort of binary you're talking about, I assume. Yes. And also this, yeah, this uh, predilection for labeling. Right. So the, you know, so in, in a way, if we just kind of, you know, if you just glance around the room that you're in or, you know, all the viewers who are watching this, like glance around the room that you're in and and take a moment to really consider all of the data that we're kind of, you know, pulling in around texture, color, form, material, you know, value, uh, historical significance of all of the different things around us, right? And uh, that helps to create a tremendous amount of meaning with respect to things. You know, of course, within the practice of Trekcha, you know, in Adi Yoga, and then also in Mahamudra as well, you know, we're, we're really trying to um, uh, cut through all of the meaning Right, so that we're just directly experiencing things as they are, and dark retreat is is really kind of, um, you know, as a togo practice, it's kind of this leap over style practice where it really kind of pushes you to begin to um, question because of experiences had, what actually is really real right and what is <laughs> what's going on here you know and um and so this does allow uh, the practitioner i feel it bleeds into other things right so it, it, i think that we could say that the the impact of this can bleed into like deity yoga or or other kinds of you know kind of um devotional practices protector practice for example where we can have this kind of very devotional relationship to these beings that are there right they are real and they are also manifestations of, of awakened mind and so it becomes um possible to you know have uh very kind of pronounced experiences of the presence of you know you know you took or or um you know, for example, in in um, towards the like I don't know three quarters of the way into the dark retreat experience and the forty nine day retreat for myself, uh, you know, the, I ended up seeing all of the bardo deities, right? All the peaceful, semi wrathful, and wrathful bardo deities in in different kinds of configuration. And so they arise, right? And just as one finds in bardo literature. Right, they arise as a manifestation of of our own mind, right? Of the our like matrix of being, and the recognition of that is the thing that allows us to be able to kind of break through into this experience of rigpa. But the failure to do that, right, and to to concretize, you know, the peaceful or the wrathful or semi wrathful becoming transfixed or scared or you know highly reactive that ends up you know creating this you know big binary split right and and then uh, we could say that the the kind of um the magic of the moment i guess you could kind of say becomes lost right because we we've, we've we've kind of fallen out of relationship in that way um so we could say that the lingering effects um of dark retreat seem to be in this i can only kind of base this on my own experience an increased predilection <laughs> towards um less structure you know towards simplicity we could say right which is which is nice especially if if one you know um is very comfortable with you know mahamudra and not yoga practice right it's like oh like you know this is actually you know, very authentically arising in me, and it's not forced. Yes, that seems to be quite a threshold in Mahamudra Yoga, forcing the 
sort of say effortless resting in the view and having it arise spontaneously. That seems to be, uh, you know, it's a bit of a contradiction in terms at the beginning, perhaps, but yeah. that seems to be quite a threshold. Well, the yoga of non-meditation, right? Like this is the thing that's a little like, you know, it's it's when when you're on one side, you're like, well, that sounds great. But what does that mean? <laughs> right? Like no effort, like, you know, everything becomes, you know, this just you know naturally free, spontaneous experience. And and of course, you know, the problem with all of these things is that, you know, we never have a clear view on on the initial side of the fence, right? Because there are just so many projections around, well, what does that mean? Well, as a practitioner, it must mean da 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 right? But then when you kind of get into it, you're like, oh, this is actually very normal, you know? And 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 that also becomes very fascinating too, to begin to see within ourselves, like, wow, you know, I really um, was making this very fanciful and elaborate, you know, uh, you know, out of respect, out of devotion, out of all these things. Um, and then once we begin to kind of recognize, uh, you know, how silly we were before, <laughs> well-intentioned, but silly, um, that also kind of opens up our eyes to the the normalcy of all of this, right? That, the, you know, the... Um, like, what does it mean to have a relationship to a protector deity? Or what does it mean to have a relationship to a Yidam, who's not only, you know, uh, the, the basis of a contemplative practice where, where we, you know, try to inhabit and open up to the direct experience of the Yidam. But then there's also just having the relationship to the deity, you know, as it is, right? And we can have a very nice, natural, relaxed relationship like this that doesn't have to be... Um, the stuff of you know constant projection and and also the the pressures that we put on ourselves around these kinds of projections too. Let me change tack for a moment and, and perhaps mm -hmm. we can come back to the visions later. I mm -hmm. have more questions about them. What's your daily routine in dark retreat? Of course, there's no clocks, you know. You know mm -hmm. So what's the daily routine? I suppose do you have to do certain kind of specific practices, meditational practices and so on? Yeah. Day. Yeah. So for the the um, I mean, you're right. Like you know the 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 you you really generally don't know what time of day it is until uh you know unless there are um the timing of meals perhaps is the only way that that you know you know um what time it is. But but even then um once your you know your circadian rhythm begins to completely just you know go out the window uh because there's no light. And so even then, you know, one might find oneself um, sleeping, well, who knows, right? At some other, some other time. Um, um, so whenever one, whenever, whatever time somebody wakes, awakens, whatever you do in the morning, right? If you, if you brush your teeth, you know, bathe, if you can bathe, whatever. Um, and then uh, I would always start so th there isn't specific guidelines for this kind of thing, but I would always start with, with um, you know, some refuge prayers, right? So just very basic, you know, thing. Um, and then I would do, um, and this is this is all additional stuff. I, I did this basically <laughs> because of my, you know, conditioned mind. Uh, a little bit of Georgia Sampa, um, uh, and then move into the actual practices themselves. And so the actual practices themselves uh, over the course of a 49 day dark retreat change every seven days. So there are seven sets of practices. And, and really um, what these are, are uh, different kinds of gazes, I guess you could say. And the gazes in the dark begin to cause you know particular kind of visionary experience to happen and as you know it's a little bit like rowing a boat like you you engage to practice a little bit and once there's movement right at the at the right rate and in the right direction you can actually put your oar down a little bit and just rest right so there's there's a a, a little bit of effort and then relaxing into ease right into this kind of treksha just you know openness and just you know staying like that and so, and, you know, because there's no way to measure time, um, you know, you have to, the throwing, uh, it, it's good to try to have, you know, four uh, turn or four, you know, meditation sessions a day. And that's, that's what I would aim for. And then, you know, sometimes it gets a little 
uh, goofed up because you might find yourself just falling asleep because you're tired. And then, you know, who knows when you wake up <laughs> or you, you know, you wake up and uh, you wake up to this like very intense visionary experience and you're laying there and then just, you know, engaging in that, you know, um, you know, direct experience. Uh, and then, you know, there are the kind of classical um, three uh, yogic postures, the posture of the lion, the posture of the elephant, and the posture of the rishi that that you can engage in as well. Um, and, and that is interesting too, because, you know, one can begin to, well, there isn't, you know, any real, like, you know, internal yogic uh, visualization or hatha yoga kind of breathing stuff that goes on, you can definitely, you know, feel the the shift in tonal difference between those three different asanas. So I would add another one, which was just like, you know, corpse, you know, posture of just laying and, uh, you know, experiencing there too, because what ends up happening is, you know, so like, for example, the last retreat I did was in a relatively small room um so i'm about six feet four inches and this room was about seven foot square right and um so i was a little interested to see the you know the previous retreats i'd done in a, in a bit of a, a bigger space um but even in a small space you, you know once the visions begin to arise your whole sense of even space changes right and so like towards the end of the retreat it felt like you know, there were hundreds of miles in every direction, even though I was just in this, you know, space that maybe if the lights were on, I would become very claustrophobic and freaked out. <laughs> you know? And were you having regular calls or contact with Dr. Nina as the retreats progressed? No. So that, that yeah, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, <laughs> no, not at all. So like during, during the, especially the, the, the pre preparatory retreat, um, you know, I spoke to him before and then after. And with the 49-day retreat too, I spoke to him before and then uh and then because he was he was entering into retreat the same time I was entering into the dark retreat and his ended um you know, like four weeks after I got out. So it wasn't until then that we were able to check in. Um uh, what would typically happen, you know, traditionally is the teacher would come every seven days to give you the instruction, right? Uh, every time that would change during the, the 49 day retreat. And of course, you know, the student would still be um, in darkness because we didn't have that opportunity um, because he was in Europe and I was in the US and because of COVID and all this. Um, what I did was I recorded all seven weeks of instructions on a digital recorder and had trained myself to be able to you know know which button to press and so at the seven seventh day mark i would then listen to the next instruction and then you know memorize that and then you know engage in that so um dr nita said um <laughs> he said this in November of last year. And then just recently, he and Bob Thurman uh, had this, uh, they gave a talk at the Rubin Museum on, on Dark Retreat. Um, uh, and there too, he was uh, telling everybody how worried he was <laughs> about me being able to, you know, handle handle all of it. And, you know, so it was it was admittedly perhaps a little risky to to do this without, you know, even, even a, a weekly check-in, you know, with the teacher. But um, <laughs> thank goodness it all worked out so to return for a moment to the visions yeah i wonder what sort of visions you began to have in that first retreat you mentioned 49 day retreat uh bardo visions in that first retreat what sort of visions were there i'm aware that and we haven't talked about this and maybe we will um mm -hmm. but it's a bit of a separate topic i'm aware that you had i think were soon to leave the your job as a prison mm -hmm. uh, chaplain and that that job had uh should we say left you with quite a bit of i think you said ptsd and a bit of trauma um mm -hmm. you know being around all that suffering the things you saw and ha had it taken its toll on you quite a lot so i wonder what it must be like to go into something like a dark retreat with all of that stored presumably just beneath the mm -hmm. 
the the threshold of conscious awareness um, that sort of trauma for example and those sorts mm -hmm. of injuries those sorts of things that you've seen are stored in there i guess so i wonder yeah. if that sort of thing did that sort of thing come out did you have personal visions related to traumas or biographical things or was it all spiritual visions of deities and nidams and so on so yeah, a really, really great, great question. Um, so the uh, during the seven day preparatory retreat, um, I had visions primarily of the way the the purified elements are experienced, and and so th these are uh, tend to be experienced the, the same way you find them. And and I the, my context for them actually was um, so in the Karma Kaju illusory body text, right? There's this. And and mostly in that one, there's this description of all of these different kind of um, experiences that arise when the elements dissolve. So, for example, um, firefly light, right? So it's described to look like you know fireflies or embers, you know, um, that 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 kind of shoot up by by a um, a bonfire uh, or full moon light or this kind of you know smoky red hazy light. Um, or this kind of, you know, vivid nighttime blue sky light. Um, and so all of those began to happen, um, you know, in, in kind of different, different order. Um, so much so that when they were happening, I was like, because, you know, again, you know, I studied the six yogas in Europa and practiced them under Gelsa Rinpoche uh, in Sikkim over the course of, um, he taught one yoga a year, more or less. And so, um, so I had, you know, good time to kind of delve into all of them. And, and that part, I never really kind of understood as like, you know, what, what is this? Right. And then I get into this retreat and I'm like, oh, not only do I know what this is, I'm experiencing this for myself. Like, this is, this is incredible. Um, so there was, there was that, um, during that, um, So during that time, also there was a um, an experience of uh, you know different kinds of animals would come, tigers. Um, I actually saw a lot of um, in in both of those retreats, the 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 initial preparatory retreat and then the forty nine day retreat, a lot of um, dead people, people who had just died, right, and various kind of. Uh, uh, um, I guess formations, right? So, I, I remember seeing like you know babies in in uh, in cribs or elderly people or middle aged people or young people, you know, in in and you know I, I used to work in hospice, so that doesn't really particularly bother me, um, but there seems to be this like high attunement to death, I guess you know that 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 I experience. Um, there were there were some kind of visionary experiences that um, you know were were meeting other 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 kinds of beings um, being offered kind of you know these gifts by other kinds of beings sometimes seeing you know uh, yadams this kind of thing especially in the in the in the seven day retreat there was there was a bit of that in the forty nine day retreat there's there was a huge amount of that. Um, I didn't have any specific um, reliving or recreation of, of any kind of trauma experience. And, and the only way I know how to be able to like, explain that is because the experience went even under that. Right. It was it was going deeper under that. And and the interesting thing about it, too, is that when I got out of the seven day retreat, I felt um, cleansed. Like I felt um, I don't mean to sound like some kind of like proselytizer, but like I, <laughs> I felt like like a, a very heavy load had been lifted off of my shoulders. And while I had been in retreat, there had been a correction officer who had died and um when I came out, my team had already, you know, attended to to all of the uh, the family and and you know providing all the support that we would do. And then, um, and right before I went into the next retreat, there was the 
the day of the funeral of this correction officer and it was a kind of very elaborate affairs so i had this my uniform on and we'd all stand you know in salute outside of the the church where the the funeral was and while standing there i knew that right after this i was going to hop into my car and drive to you know the destination of my 49 day retreat and i could feel there was like i could feel like a a pull like you know you need to you need to keep going you know you need to keep going so um there was a shift that was happening uh for me at that time um that I do feel like on some level, perhaps we could say it was a purification. On another level, perhaps it's it's more helpful to actually think of it as a shedding, you know, of of this kind of stuff. Um, and then and then in the 49 day dark retreat in particular, at one point, probably about halfway through, uh, I just, you know, kind of heard this voice within myself uh, literally saying, you know, or asking me, uh, like, why? why are you kind of, you know, shoulder or neck deep in other people's suffering with them, journeying with them, when you should be helping them to liberate themselves, right? And it was an interesting thing. And at that point, I was like, oh, you know, I need to quit my job. And, you know, of course, you could say that in the middle of a dark retreat, <laughs> you need to wait for your retreat to end and all this stuff. And then and then it took me about... Um, uh, six or seven months to be able to kind of get everything in place to be able to make that make that shift um but it 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 also um so in this like you know another another kind of shift of mine i still you know love the discipline of chaplaincy but there's a big difference between chaplaincy and helping beings to 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 self-liberate you know um and so because of the experience I had in the dark retreat, then I, um, maybe that was my conversion experience. <laughs> it's like, you know, um, so maybe, you know, maybe this was, um, you know, this moment where I became, you know, confirmed by Rigpa, as it were, um, towards the beauty and power of that experience that showed me that while all of my intentions were very, very kind of pure around engaging chaplaincy, that that was still missing the mark. You know, that's still, um, you know, rooted in a um, a series of constructs that are more oriented around meaning making, which is fine, but there's a big difference between meaning making and resting into the the purity of rigpa. Right? Meaning making is creation right it is it is uh conceptual too it's also based on all sorts of ideas right versus just you know <laughs> resting on the side of a river like tilopa or you know uh resting in space like Lanchampa. could you parse some of the meaning making that you were doing as a chaplain before this epiphany that i presume you associated with your uh, religious vocation uh, could you parse parse that a little with some examples perhaps um can you can, we, can you restate the question if you don't mind yeah you've stated that the your role as a chaplain you had good intentions mm -hmm. and i i've i've read you to have written that your motivation for being a chaplain was at least in part uh, associated with your religious vocation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, an expression of that in some way. So now you're saying that that misses the mark compared to this yeah. yes. authentic resting in Rigpa. So I'm wondering if you might, I suppose, express some of those yeah. meaning makings that you were doing. Uh, what were they? Those almost, but not quite, sorts of views or positions or or um frames you're operating from that mm -hmm. that were sort of if you want disambiguated from what resting in rigpa really means yeah yeah no yeah okay so chaplaincy in in one way is kind of like uh you know the archaeology of the spirit or spiritual life of the person you're working with right so 
um, there's this work, sometimes quite detailed work in, in helping people who want to be able to access uh, their spirituality at the end of life. And perhaps they haven't really had much relationship to their, you know, their spirituality over the past, you know, several decades. And so, so it is very archaeological in this way, and that, that we're kind of, you know, um, almost like in the work of like Jungian analysis, right? Trying to sift through people's experience of life, of death, of love, of transcendence, of uh, agency and and uh you know and then making sense of what is it what does it mean to die you know what comes next um and so it, it's a powerful practice because uh, you know especially if you can be somebody who is very attuned to deep listening and staying out of your own way and and you know letting other people lead um and there is something very kind of quote unquote constructive about it because one is helping another person to build, right? And the resting into Rigpa, at least my experience of it in in especially within the context of dark retreat, is more like experiencing a healing ease, right? And I I am almost one hundred percent convinced, just personally that there is a profound healing opportunity that exists within uh, the practice of Yangti or dark retreat um, because one is forced to have to let go of all of our dependency on storyline, on constructs, on on even meaning making, right? Like the this whole idea of like, I can, you know, even in my own spiritual life, I can, you know, we, we can all, no matter what our spiritual traditions are, uh, define ourselves in relationship to larger lineage, right? And so there are these ways of dropping these plumb lines, right? And and these plumb lines are helpful because they they help um, help us to connect to a a force of practice that is much greater than ourselves, right? So all of the all of the teachers before us who inspired one another that then have therefore inspired us and brought us closer and closer to all this. So that's that's one way of looking at it. And in in a way it's also maybe you could say very male too, because because it is quote unquote constructive. There is a building. Right. But with resting into Rigba, it's kind of like you unzip and you take all of this off and you just rest into space itself. And you, interestingly enough, return back to the source of that entire lineage. Right? And that's where the that's where, not only is that where healing is, but but this kind of getting back to the original kind of uh, uh, question, that is the way to skillfully inhabit this transference of transference of dharma from one location to another. Like, what's the best way to do it? Unzip everything and just jump in, right? And then you're there. I was talking with a friend of mine in Nepal. Um, uh, the other day, you know, via Zoom, and we were talking about the difference between, you know, you find these instances of short lineage and long lineage. Short lineage being, uh, well, long lineage rather being, you know, that, you know, practice came from Guru Rinpoche to one of his students to one of his, you know, this long do 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 thing, right? Um, and then the short lineage being visionary, right? All of a sudden, you know, somebody in today's time or one generation ago has a vision of Guru Rinpoche and Guru Rinpoche says, okay, you know, here, this is the way it is. And and then, you know, they if it's a dream or, you know, some other vision, you know, they, they come out of that experience and they have experienced that, right? And so I'm, you know, much more interested now in this kind of, you know, not, you know, short lineage because we need to create short lineages, but I think helping people to come in closer contact to that right um not to bypass you know lineage because it's it's a beautiful um thing it's also a political thing too it's very complicated um but that direct relationship right that direct experience of resting into the natural state that is a thing that that um completely bridges a thousand years, 
you know, of transmission or 2000 years of transmission, depending, you know, or, or, or longer. Um, and so I think it's also healing because we're, we are, you know, this, this idea of returning to our natural state, right, is, is returning to a way of being that is much more variegated and much deeper in terms of awareness than we experience being to be now, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's very interesting. I can, from that description, imagine how it is that this experience, which you, your, your confirmation, as you put it, would supersede even your technical ordination as a raper. Yeah. Oh, it totally, you know, makes me want to, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not to say nothing matters, right? But it's interesting because like, you know, Dr. Nita, like we had, after I did the 49 day retreat um, and, and Dr. Nita was out of retreat, there was this break for a couple of days be between his two retreats. And so we met by Zoom and, you know, we had a little bit of like his examination where, you know, he, he wanted to, you know, confirm my experiences and all of this. So we went through all of that and, you know, sometimes the nature of the visions, all of this kind of stuff. And then and his last question was like, you know, it was like, oh, you know, I have one more question. And I was like, oh, like, yes, you know, what is it again? And he was like, you know, when you when you see Dharma, right? Or when you think of Dharma, do you see lots of lots of different kinds of practices or do you not care anymore? I was like, I don't care anymore. And he was like, good. Like, you know, this is the the kind of, you know, key component to this practice. And I, I'm not saying this about to anything about myself as much as, you know, there is something exceptionally profound in um, understanding that the totality of everything occurs right here, right? So that when we, you know, so previously for me, um, you know, the the quote unquote transference of Dharma from one location to another was based on all the causes and conditions needing to be in place, right? It was kind of like a very kind of almost Mahayana way of, lo of looking at things. And even Vajrayana, like, you know, this kind of Tantrayana way of looking at things, right? And then, but, but, you know, really the thing is, is, is now is always the time, you know, Guru Mpache is now, you know, Naropa is now, Tilopa is now, Saraha is now, anybody who's achieved rainbow body is now, right, is constantly here, right? The, the, um, you know, we find these, these lines like in uh, Saraha, in one of his dohas says, you know, you don't need to go to Lanka, right? You don't need to go on pilgrimage to some other place to experience the nature of mind. You can do it right here, like, you know, and, you know, of course we will read these things and say, oh yeah, okay. But, you know, he was, he was, he was teaching that to, you know, someone else, you know, maybe like, you know, Shavarupa or someone. And, you know, he was also a Mahasiddha. And so of course we need to go to India for, <laughs> because I'm flawed and stupid and, you know, not from a Buddhist culture and all this stuff, but, but, and, and thereby we are, you know, completely sullying this like very profound point right here, right here. And the thing about dark retreat is that it's right here and there's nothing to see. And you are forced then to then, you know, experience, um, you know, Dr. Nita likes to call it like, you know, our, our own inner light, right? Um and we could we could you know elaborate that a little bit and say you know we're forced to experience the luminosity of our own mind right and our relationship the constancy of the experience of rikpa that is always available to us you know and and that is that is like you know i mean talk about <laughs> buddhism for dummies <laughs> right i mean and of course that's that's it's much more complicated than that but um but that the immediacy of that I think is, uh, you know, in a way, like I've been thinking quite a bit about this also, like in relationship to how, for example, Trungpa and Kempo Gongshar taught um, when it was clear that the Chinese were invading Tibet, right? They both more or less decided like, you know, we need to throw convention out and we need to introduce as many people as possible to the direct experience of their mind because so many people are going to die. Right. And, you know, I think we're we're in a kind of very similar kind of situation, except it's not just the Tibetan people, it's it's the whole world, 
right? It is, it is, you know, with the, with the environmental crisis and all these other things going on right now, um, you know, we, we are in this place, this state or this experience where the only way we're going to solve some of these problems is to, to have a mind that's totally liberated from, from binaries. And even if we can't solve the situation then we need to, to go around and help liberate people so that, uh, you know, there can be um, a cessation of suffering. It seems that Dr. Nida has, if you like, ratified your epiphany and its significance because you now, and for some time, have been teaching Ati Yoga under his banner, so to speak, which is no small thing to do. Could you say a little bit about how that came to happen? <laughs> yeah, that was that was interesting because um, it started off with my teaching um, a Weapon of Light, which I taught in the um, fall of 2021 um, or 20, yeah, 2021. And it was funny because I taught that and then, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, it was like over eight weeks or something. And then I went out to he was in Pearland Farms and I went out there and, and really nobody was there so we just got to spend some time together and we were we're sitting talking and he's like oh you know you finally taught you know weapon of light i'm so glad and i was like oh you know what do you mean and he's like oh, i told you to teach this like back in 2016 <laughs> when it first came out and i was like i don't remember that at all Ginla. and he's like no i did but it took you a long time but you finally did it and i was like okay and so um so yeah, you know, I mean, he, uh, I'm exceptionally grateful to him um, that that he, uh, you know, asked me to teach um, Weapon of Light, um, and we spent, um, yeah, I mean, like he's, uh, so I consider him my primary, you know, Dzogchen teacher, um, and you know, he has tested me and continues to test me, you know, as, as I, you know, my practice develops, uh, it's definitely not something that I take lightly, but it's also something that I don't try to, you know, <laughs> like puff myself up about either. Um, yeah, I mean, so much, uh, you know, either the relationship is quite good. The, 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 you took me approach to Ati Yoga, I think is, is phenomenally, um, profound, uh, and simple. And I think this is the thing too, that makes it a little misleading for people is the simplicity, you know, people will sometimes equate with, uh, oh, it's very basic, you know, but the reality of the situation is simplicity, you know, much like we find in the arts, right? Simplicity tends to be a mark of mastery, right? If you can really rest into simplicity, if you can paint with simplicity, compose with simplicity, et cetera, dance with simplicity, um, it means you really have to have, you know, some kind of mastery. And so the, the Yutuk Nintik presentation, not just of, of you know, Ati Yoga, but but all of the yogas, is, you know, seems to be very imbued with a, with a, a power that is, um, I think, very real and palpable. Um, and so Dr. Nita has also, um, you know, given me permission to... Um, I mean, we're we're in the initial phases of this, but he and I are working on developing a retreat center dedicated to young to yoga practice um, in New York State, and so we're in this kind of fundraising um, uh, activity portion now. Um, but he, you know, once that is, it goes, and he's also given me, uh, you know, the blessing to lead people in these retreat experiences of young to practice as well which is something that, um, again, you know, I hold very tight and dear to my heart and uh, take, you know, the, the responsibility of this very, very seriously. Um, you know, there's the other thing that, that it just fills me with joy about is, is having that kind of, you know, karmic connection with him, um, you know, is, uh, this feels very um, special. So, um yeah, I you know I, I take all of this very very seriously. Could you say a little bit more about what you meant by the specialness of the karmic connection? Oh yeah, well I mean, you know, 
it's very hard to come across somebody who has done dark retreat, let alone to have a teacher <laughs> to teach you dark retreat. And then let alone to have a teacher who teaches you dark retreat, who is, you know, giving you permission to teach, you know, Ati yoga and then, and then work with them to develop a young D, you know, yoga retreat center. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm done trying to figure this kind of stuff out because it's just, there's no point, but, but with Dr. Nita, I just, I feel like, uh, you know, the closest of our bond is just, it's there and uh, I celebrate that. Um, and I've had, you know, similar kinds of experiences with other teachers. Like, um, you know, I was in um, Bhutan with Dr. Nita earlier in 2022, but before that I went to go see Gelsa Prampache, uh in Sikkim. And, you know, for, you know, and Gelsa Prampache is an incredibly, you know, important tulku in the Karmakaji tradition. And, uh, it can be hard to kind of get close to somebody like that, but over over um, you know the course of um, I don't know you know almost twenty years, like we've we've become close, and he gave me permission to transmit the karma nintik in um, you know so Rangjung Dorje's uh, Ati Yoga cycle um, in September, and you know these kinds of things. Um, Again, that I take really, you know, when I, I was talking with him about Ati Yoga and about the Karma Nintik, and he was like, you know, I only know two people who are interested in this topic, and it's you and Karmapa. Um, and, you know, he's like, it would be very good for you to begin to kind of propagate this. And, you know, there there was a time in my life where, you know, I would try and figure out, oh, gosh, you know, how how does how does some, you know, guy from New York City like meet someone like Gelsa Rinpoche or meet someone like Dr. Nita or meet someone like Patung Rinpoche or, you know, and then now I'm just like, well, you know, underneath the, uh, you know, underneath this this veneer of some kind of appearance I seem to have right now is, is some other thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm comfortable with just leaving it with that and, and I don't need to get into um you know the what it means you know kind of thing um it's clearly happening for some kind of reason yes and and still in the process you said of happening and unfolding which is quite an exciting time indeed I yeah. wonder yeah I wonder you know sometimes uh, one hears with these sorts of experiences these sorts of uh, periods that they're they're seasonal in a sense that there can be a time of great opening mm -hmm. um, and then a time of integration perhaps and then even sometimes sort of time of desert times of various times mm -hmm. i wonder um one of the things that's sometimes associated with the period of opening is a loss of certain kind of functionality in other domains mm -hmm. um, uh, for for example um, social interactions Mm -hmm. or meeting professional demands or you know being on time and you know that sort of thing <laughs> yes. um, or even regulating emotion etc you know that can that can sometimes be the case so a, a reorganization sometimes of those elements um occurs so and that's i suppose one of the things that's called integration so i wonder did you notice that at all a loss of any kind of functionality yeah. or change maybe is another way of saying it in functua in functionality yeah, you know, I mean, this is a this is really interesting and timely question. Um, I think, you know, the biggest change that I've noticed is um, I don't know how how to say this. Um, well, so I'm just gonna say, like, I I have a um, like a deep sadness wells up in me when I find myself in situations. Uh, where where people it's so evident that people are just this the highly conceptual structure of their thinking or being and especially in the context of dharma you know people come with a super super you know constellated idea of what everything is including themselves and my first inclination is what to want to cry you know like it it's um so i guess this is saying or me saying that there is a um, a little bit of retreating into myself on one level for for safety, so to speak, because 
it is so intense. <laughs> the Dharma world is so intense. People's ideas about Dharma practice is intense. Mine was too. And this is the thing is I could see, you know, I had this really kind of p- powerful uh, experience with my root teacher where I had a very highly polished idea of who I was. And she, we were having breakfast and she just kept poking holes in it, poking holes. And, and it was just, you know, it was, it was polite. It was nice, you know, breakfast conversation, but she just kept going there. I remember completely breaking down. I was like, what are you doing? You know, you're <laughs> like, I was like crying and she's like, go take a walk. Can you be specific? Um, yeah. I mean, like, you know, uh, so I was young, I was, um, probably 20 or definitely 20 years old. And, you know, I had an idea about who I was and what I was going to do. Right. And, and, you know, that, that, that time in life, right. Even though I was in India, you know, exploring and all this stuff, like, you know, um, I had an idea of who I was. I had an idea of what Dharma practice meant to me. I had a view or vision of how I was going to relate to it and all of this. And, and she called me out on it. You know, she's like, that's just a bunch of ideas. Like, you're just, you're stuck in your head. Like, you know, you need to get out of this, you know, well, what do you mean? You know, like, you know, you're not even real. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, you know, all of your ideas are constructed. Maybe they come from someone else, or maybe it's because you like to please your parents, or maybe, you know, just going there, going there, going there, like ex- exposing, exposing, you know, conditioning, essentially, right? And so now, even even being <laughs> sub-conversations that don't have anything to do, they're just tangential conversations in, in everyday life that are just highly structured, highly, uh, you know, conceptual in nature, I tend to kind of t- need to take a little step back and just, you know, occupy space. Um, I kind of liken it a little bit to, you know, there's that story of... Um, Naropa, when he is, you know, he's, he's apparently like reading out, you know, in a field somewhere and this Dakini comes up to him, you know, and it's like, oh, do you, do you understand the meaning or the words? And he was like, oh, I understand the words. And, and she starts, you know, celebrating and he's like, oh, you know, if, if I tell her, I understand the meaning too, she's going to celebrate even more. And so he's like, oh, and I understand the meaning. And then she starts crying. <laughs> that's the way I feel these days it's like I feel I feel like an old bikini (laughs) I don't know if that's helpful but Mm. you know um and um you know I think the other thing is 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 just this very palpable um awareness of of how that you know addictive reliance on concept uh keeps people um separated from the Rigpa experience, right? And therefore stuck in in an experience of suffering, right? And that is, um, that's tremendously hard to watch, you know? Um, and, you know, again, as you point out, we're all in movement, right? Where everything is impermanent, right? Everything is changing. Everything is is, is transitioning in one way or another. So the upside of this is that everybody has the ability, right? The potential to be able to move into the space of openness. I wonder, and may not be possible, I wonder if you can think of um, an anecdote or a particular concept, uh, an anecdote of this encountering this sort of conceptual fixedness in a religious context that, like, I mean, lately, recently, that struck you in this sort of a way. Um, yeah, so I have some students who have a, uh, a very, so let's put it this way, in, um, even in the practice of Tantra, right, there's still concept, right? So in the practice of Tantra, there's, there's transformation, right? Transformation involves activity, and it involves creating change, right? And don't get me wrong, like, you know, the tantric path is beautiful, right? It's, it's vivacious, it's full of power, it's full of dynamism, it's, it's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's an expression of nature itself. Uh, and I, and I love it. And though, like, I, I seem to encounter people who are, who are very kind of transfixed in that world. And it is as if, as if they are in this kind of like kaleidoscopic 
hallucinatory field of of just you know marveling at you know the five buddha families and the three kayas or four kayas and and just you know it's as if they're stuck just playing in the world of tantra right and then when you know i will try and orient people more towards non-conceptual practice like you know you need to cut through this you know and then people turn around and then ask me for the transmission for some kind of like you know sadhana related to tantra and i'm like you know oh my god why are you not listening to me you know um so it's kind of like um when somebody can't appreciate the flavor of the sweet you're trying to offer them like take this this is so good oh no 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 i have all of this no 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 no. please this one is this will dissolve everything no i have i have all of it (laughs) you know that um you know and 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 then of course you know being in my position it's it's also kind of remembering myself and remembering the journey right that that you know people can only be able to hear and um connect to that which they're ready for and so even even kind of going back to my relationship to dr nita i have no memory of him telling me to teach <laughs> weapon of light but he apparently did a long time ago right and so in that moment it, i probably would have gone right to my head oh you know this nakba you know from amdo told me to teach you know his introduction to ati yoga thing and you know, probably would have done that actually like you know been a you know this thing this gift he was giving me probably would have become a poison for me um and and you know again like i do think that you know there there are ways of approaching ati yoga that are directed right and 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 in this way like intentional but, but i think that the the practice itself is um is relatively passive right and about resting into openness and you know sometimes you just have to wait for people to be able to be able to have that capacity and so there's a lot of just you know patience (laughs) needed (laughs) yeah and the classic uh, strategy of acting or speaking in such a way to throw a spanner in the works isn't particularly good for student retention (laughs) especially these days you know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so we were like oh god you know they were verbally abusive to me you know like <laughs> they told me to shut up they told me to put that book away they told me to stop doing this right and and so you know the, this is interesting um the there there uh, there are these holes sometimes for some people or maybe culturally that are hard to cross um you know i can hear my teachers being very critical of me right out of love to kind of move me in the direction right but i can also see and i've heard instances of other teachers doing that in other avenues especially here in the west where people are like oh no no, that person's that person's abusive and it's like well you know the the you know for lack of a better term like the contract we're signing here right if if the teacher is really committing to me and I need to, you know, open up to the fact that they have, you know, more wisdom and experience than I do. then, you know, sometimes, you know, I just need to shut up and listen. And, and in our culture, um, that's complicated, you know? So it's interesting. I've, I've had conversations with some people like, uh, you know, a senior Zen, teacher in the US. And then also, um, I've been having some conversations with Melvin McLeod from uh, Lion's Roar about like, you know, where is this going? Like, you know, in this, you know, so my generation is is kind of like, you know, in between the boomer generation that helped plant a lot of the seeds and, and cause a lot of this to, to exist uh, here in the West. And, and, you know, there does seem to be some curiosity about like is this even something that's able to to last at least on this scale you know here in the west um and again you know it's going to be whatever it is um but in terms of pedagogy you know there are a lot of a lot of really interesting conundrums 
Are you talking about the sort of view that one hears expressed sometimes that, well, it's it's um, these sorts of practices, particularly of the sort of Tibetan Buddhist orientation, although I understand that's a bit limited in, in describing it that way, but for want of a better description, it's it's sort of trendy at the moment, relatively speaking, as yoga was at a certain point and still is in a sort of way. And maybe it's uh, going to recede a bit, or a Zen, maybe that's a better example. A Zen, mm. a Zen was really trendy, right, at, at a certain time with the beats and so on. And, yeah. uh, and then sort of still, people are still into it and all that in, in the States, but it's, it's not quite, doesn't hold quite the position it had in its cultural relevance. And so I have heard people say things, you know, speculate about that. Well, you know, we have the Dalai Lama, we have uh, you know, these sort of charismatic figures that, in a sense, uh, support that interest and support that international curiosity. What happens when, when those sorts of figures are no longer there? Will, you know, will will it go the way of Zen in a certain sense? You know? Yeah, uh, is that well, the sort of thing you're talking about? A little bit. I mean, I think the, uh, but more about non-duality itself, right? I mean, like non-duality is um, <laughs> it. It's it feels great until you then realize how binary this whole like you know world system is right and then especially like we take the united states in particular i mean we're so bifurcated with everything these days that you know to exist in this society or culture in a non-dual way is to experience a tremendous amount of um pushback all the time, let alone to try and, you know, instill this experience in others, you know? Yeah. And in that sense, in that sense, non-duality is the ultimate duality. Surely it's, it's the best product for the culture. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, I'm convinced of this. Like this is the medicine for our times. Um, I'm not even saying it's a medicine. It could, it could just be accelerant. (laughs) Well, uh, and some medicines are an accelerant like that, but I mean, um, I, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's probably going to recede a little bit, you know, from the center of the culture, which is where it probably should be too. You know, this is not, this is not, um, it never has been, um, you know, the occupying the center stage of, of spiritual practice. I mean, even in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, when you look at things like dark retreat, this is, you know, off on the side and the people who are real kind of technical masters of of the practice were very revered, but then also um, <laughs> they were a little unusual, you know, they were odd characters, you know, so to speak, right? Um, and I think that there's, you know, maybe you could say a little bit of an occupational hazard, so to speak, you know, around that. Um, but this is why, like, you know, I think that, that uh, in what we're seeing right now with all this interest in dark retreat, that, you know, that of course will, will wane over time, um, Oh, I see. Mm. You know. Yeah. Well, this has been such a fascinating conversation, Justin. Thank you. Yeah, I wonder, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I wonder if there's anything else to say. Uh, I, I suppose we're coming to, a bit towards the end of our time together, so I wonder if there's anything to say, anything I haven't asked about, or anything that comes to mind that you'd like to express. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, what is worth saying is, you know, the that I, I do think Yanti practice. I mean, I I really do feel this way. I feel that Ati Yoga in general, and, and Dr. Nita said this. I believe this as well. That you know, there is this kind of. Um, healing component associated with the practice that it is as if it is akin to a very very kind of um i mean the the like this liberatory psychotherapy style of you know this is like a little bit dr nita's way of speaking right that that it is a um it is a medicine for our experience of mind and phenomenon and so I think there is there there are a lot of applications for Yangti practice, uh, and I don't necessarily mean outside of the tradition, but I think that it 
has the ability to breathe new life into people's experience in a really profound way. Um, and, you know, there's, there, there, there are issues around it where it requires commitment to practice, right? It, it requires some desire to want to be able to master one's own experience of one's own mind. Um, and if people are interested in that, though, uh, the benefits are, are, are huge. You know, I think, I, I, I think that, you know, I really feel like the benefits uh, transcend our ability to even categorize them. Right? And in these moments, especially now where we are looking for ways of successfully addressing the sufferings that we find on the planet, it's it's worth really looking into young deep practice as a way to help resource people to be able to do that important work. You know, um, so it's a little bit of this kind of like bridging out of the the technical location of the tradition into a a a a towards a slightly larger um population than the traditional practitioners of dark retreat if that makes sense yeah well i wonder then i might ask you a question about that yeah the um no i think when you put it that way there's a you know if we're thinking about the future of such things there's a tremendous market i think for that kind of thing the the ultimate uh, experience, right? I think that's always been something of part of the marketing of even the labeling of mm -hmm. these sorts of systems. You know, this is the, the yes. greater. You know, this is the ati. This is the you know this sort of thing. And um, so I think there's always an interest in that. And from psychonauts who otherwise, or maybe last week would have been doing ayahuasca mm -hmm. visions you say yeah. that sounds great sign me up i'd love to see some visions there's that also religious practitioners who may yes. be some of whom can be somewhat frustrated by the lack of quote-unquote results mm -hmm. or experiences mm -hmm. uh, one hears that and then there are people like you who as you said, you had done Mahamudra and Chektrode and so on for 25 years, had quite a background indeed, and seemed ripe to fall from the tree in a sense, in, in, in a way. Th th those are very different ranges of people, yes. from sort of tech, tech, uh, tech billionaires, you know, <laughs> looking for the ultimate edge, right? I mean, now I'm, I'm saying all the classic tropes here, to, yeah. um, you know, to uh, decades of practice and so on and so forth, just mm -hmm. ready, to, ready to pop. So... Um, how do you plan to filter that um, yeah. in your own venture with Dr. Nita, guiding others in dark retreat? Yeah, yeah, no, this is a very, very good question. So the 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 you know a basis in Chukcha is is kind of key, right? People having you know some stability in that uh, experience is um, is vital. Um, and so everybody will need to be, you know, introduced to the practice of Trekcha and then engage, you know, uh, the practice for some time. Um, and then, you know, people will most likely be able to engage dark retreat for much shorter periods of time, you know, just starting off with even just familiarizing oneself with one day, you know, see what that's like to three days and kind of, you know, hover around that kind of experience until you know they're known you know we can kind of assess uh, uh preparedness etc maybe then moving slowly into the preparatory you know seven day retreat and then just kind of hanging out there i i wouldn't expect anybody doing a, a 49 day retreat um anytime soon other than other than myself perhaps um, like I, I would like to, I would like to try three months um, once the retreat center is open. Um, but uh, you know, again, I, I do think actually this is where this intersection of chaplaincy and all of this works very well. Uh, you know, my work with 
um, spiritual assessment that you find in chaplaincy is a really uh, useful kind of point of orientation around this with respect to, of course, everybody wants, you know, the, the, the penultimate experience, um, but it doesn't take much to look around and see how dangerous, you know, that can be even, I mean, you know, there were days like in the, in the late nineties when I used to spend a lot of time in Bodh Gaya, you know, that I, I had um, used to stay at the Burmese Vihar there and, one winter season, two people committed suicide after coming out of Vipassana retreats. Um, and so the, that, the, you know, the the risks of this is kind of like seared into my consciousness just from being, you know, in, in the area of, of this kind of thing happening, um, you know, just, just, you know, tangentially. Um, and yeah, I have spoken with somebody who did a dark retreat in a facility where there wasn't any kind of guidelines around previous training and it wasn't until after they got out of the retreat where they they asked the owners like well why don't you guys have like some sort of policy like this someplace and they were like well we don't think it's that important and as I, I was you know when i met with this person i was like do you understand how dangerous that is you know and and they're like i do now you know i didn't at the time <laughs> so you know like my goal is whatever Dr. Nita and I do with this, that it that it is stable <laughs> and it is uh it 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 alleviates harm, it doesn't create harm, you know. And so so there's there's you know gonna be you know a fine balance. Um uh but I, I don't think it'll be that hard to achieve. But you know, it will it will also most likely be a little unpopular for some people who really kind of you know buy into the real kind of orthodox you know, position of, of this is, you know, ultimate secret, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, it's part of the course, I suppose. Oh, very interesting. And, and so if people wanted to support that venture or get in contact with you about that, what's the best way for them to do so? Yeah, they can go to uh, yangtiyoga.com. And, uh, you know, the website's up and it's, it's you know, looking, <laughs> looking nice. And we're going to have an online platform, uh, online learning platform um, up this summer where we will be able to start some programming and training, especially around Trekja um, this summer. And then, uh, and also engaging, you know, Dr. Nita brought up to me last year, he's like, you know, you should also focus a lot on death related things too. So Bardo practice and, and this kind of stuff. So, so we'll also have, um, you know, some good programs, you know, uh, encapsulating that as well. Oh, Yangtiyoga.com. I wish you the best with that. Yeah. Thank thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Steve. Justin Van Boydash. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.